welcome Brian Trenchard Smith uh, to Red River Podcast. We're, we're out of Long Island, New York, and we basically talk music, movies, and pop culture with, with guests. And I, the way we stumbled onto you and your work, we did a review of a movie called Rocktober, Rocktober Blood. Do you know mm-hmm. that movie? I, I, I don't know it well, but I know the sorcery. Before. Yes. <laughs> So we we were like, who the fuck is this band on this soundtrack? And then we started digging and then we realized that they had something called stunt rock. And then from there, when I matched up the name, I was like, this is the guy that made um, Night of the Demons 2 and Leprechaun 3, which we fucking love. And BMX so, bandits, yeah, and BMX huge bandits, as a kid, yeah, dead, dead end, dead end driving, like, uh, just so we had no idea that your career went backwards into like the seventies. So we were like, let's just like reach out to him because like you, you have such a amazing career. And then I ended up getting this book, which is uh, Adventures in the B Movie Trade. So. Yeah. If you put it up in front of the camera, they we will be able to see that they, they dare <laughs> go. Presentation is everything. Yes. Okay, adventures in the B movie trade. I, I was in such a rush, I didn't bring my copy down. Uh, but uh, feel free to flash it again at some other point. <laughs> I will. Yeah. Anyway, that, five hundred and eighty I... pages, two hundred of them in color in the hardcover edition. Um, all I can say to your listeners is. Uh, it's informative, and you can certainly on oh, my wonderful wife. Yes, just, there you go. I can do sort of heavy duty plugging here, uh, but uh, um, there I am with a lion called Sudan, who was very good and didn't bite me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, her brother, his brother rather, had uh, uh, bitten the trainer once on the uh, the thigh, just a sort of friendly nip, but you know, yeah. You know, Three inch in sizes can be a little unforgiving. Uh, anyway, but uh, wonderful working with animals, by the way. Uh, I've always enjoyed that. Well, I is a virtue in that situation. And and I saw like, you know, like we saw footage of like Grant Page, like like <laughs> bobbing and weaving with like a tiger or something like mm. that guy's crazy. A leopard. Leopard, yes. But before we don't, we, don't smack it. Don't, if, not a good idea. Don't whack the leopard. So well, it will smack you back. <laughs> we like you know we're not going to hold you hostage forever so like you have such a there's so much stuff in this book that i really kind of just want to like touch on certain things and 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 before you started making movies you know with uh uh in 1975 you were doing trailers right yes yes i i started uh initially as a news cutter a news film cutter uh you know, stories would come in uh on 16 millimeter uh, and uh, journalists would say, give me five seconds of this, give me 10 seconds of that, or you know, make it interesting for 25 seconds, show me something, and then I'll write something over it, et cetera. So, and this was an interesting sort of high pressure uh, day, which would build in intensity uh, from, you know, you come in at nine, cut the overseas stories that had come in overnight, and then the local stories would come in and... Uh, Pressure would build, and it was the race to get the twenty odd uh, edited clips uh, assembled in the right order on a reel, and race it round to Telecine and get it laced up, ready to go uh, at uh, six twenty nine, uh, so that six thirty news could roll with the lead story. Uh, and you know, in my book, I I give a couple of um, embarrassing examples of of hurried mistakes that I yes. made. Um, and, and, uh, anyway, the book is intended to be sort of, uh, you know, lessons from a career and encouragement for people who wish to enter the arena uh, of gladiatorial combat, otherwise known as the film industry. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, uh, which is so different now. I, I honestly, it's hmm. like from from where you started to like now, it's like you could, I mean, you get a, you get somebody like Steven Soderbergh, even if you take away his name. Uh, or we have friends that make movies on an iPhone. Like, you know, who, who would have who would have ever thought that? And then from there, it's just a matter of distribution. But now there's so many streaming channels and options. But it's like I feel like it's it like it's hard, it's easier to be found, but harder to be seen because there's just like an influx of things. Like, wouldn't you say? 
Well, I mean, anyone can find you on TikTok if you <laughs> uh, if you you know understand how to give them sort of uh, uh, interesting content in, uh, in 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 you know in in fifteen seconds or so. You're uh, right. That will catch their eyeballs, but. Um, structuring drama over 90 to 100 minutes, of course, is a slightly different exercise. Uh, look, uh, Soderbergh himself actually shot a film that he did with Claire Foy, who was, I can't, played someone uh, unjustifiably um, kept in a mental health institution due to so good. corruption. He shot that on, a, on cell phones. Yep. It's, uh, un unsane is so, so you saw the movie. Yeah, I did. And oh, I, amazing. I thought, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's simple, but effective. Uh, it's, uh, he, he's just, whatever he turns his hand to, Soderbergh makes it interesting. So I always watch a Soderbergh film. Just as in my youth, you know, there were directors whose films I would always want to watch. Obviously, the, the classics, you know, John Ford, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, you know, but uh, there were always other interesting uh, filmmakers like Robert Aldrich. Whenever you, whenever there was a Robert Aldrich film, you you were going to get something different. You you'd get a a very tough minded approach to the subject matter that uh, was uh, you know a signature of of Robert Aldrich. But um, yeah, there were uh, so yeah I I I, I yeah you know, so I grew up on watching directors uh, who. You know, carried out their work generally with classical style, and so I'm, I'm a bit of a classicist, and in terms of, you know, my adherence to film grammar, uh, and uh, you know, I so um, so it, it it that 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 has certainly you know, I I, I absorbed uh, let's say the a great deal of Hollywood and and British filmmaking uh, in my teens uh, and on. Absolutely. I, I, I was going to say I, what I love now is like you can, you know, so how um, Google, you could enter Google and now it's like, you know, before that, like like one of our mutual fan, you know, uh, friends here, I, uh, you know, like a movie director that we love Tarantino. Right. So like anything, oh. anything Tarantino makes, we're watching 100 percent. But now, like we were able to just basically uh put anything into Google and then from there you have a list of movies like the IMDB so someone like you like we piece together everything that you did and we're like this guy's career is crazy so sorry to interrupt Brian go ahead uh, no, uh, I could be interrupted at all times oh the uh, other the other Brian Langan up there oh, oh okay <laughs> that's fine no well uh, I'm look I'm a big admirer of Quentin Tarantino obviously and he's actually coming to Portland next month and I uh, will see him then uh and uh, but um, uh, he is someone also who just grew up on on movies and absorbed you know all sorts of you know styles and influences uh, and uh, you know then made them his own and yeah. uh, uh, and so I just hope he doesn't stop at ten movies um, but on the other hand yeah. I uh, you know it's it's up to him he's 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 an artist. Um, uh, I couldn't stop at 10 movies. Uh, well, I couldn't afford to. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, um, but there's, I, there's, I, a, there's a beauty in working, you know, it's like you, it's, well, it's like, it's, it's like you, you, you know, like we, pl I play music. So it's like, I can't imagine like ever stopping to play, even if no one watches or listens to what I'm doing. It's, it's something that like, I just like to do. So it's like, yeah, like for him to be like, I'm, th there's a respect to someone who says what he says, he's, he's leaving after 10. Uh, but then there's also respect for people that, that continue to work, you know, like I know the last thing you did was a while ago, but you know, your, your filmography speaks for itself. Cause it's just so vast with everything that you've done. But. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think Quentin is, uh, going to spend more time writing, writing. books, uh, but, yeah, who knows? Uh, I mean, he'll get a, a rush of creative blood to the head one day and suddenly an, an amazing movie like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood will come out of him. Uh, and uh, you just it, never know. I, it was a, he was talk of him doing writing a Star Trek script. I don't know what. It yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, he's but, a great ambassador of film, too. And when I when I, I read 
and follow him when he recommends like, oh, you should see this movie from 1970. I'm right there. And that, through him is how I learned about this amazing Australian movie scene that was just, I mean, it was like wild, wild west out there. Stunts going on. It, it's crazy. It, it, yeah. Talk about the early days of that. Yeah, of the Ausploitation uh, era. And, well, I mean, uh, the uh, the Australian film industry renaissance, which uh, occurred with a great deal of government assistance from 1970 onwards, uh, uh, has resulted in, you know, uh, a film industry that is the equal of any in any country in the world. Uh, you can you want to you want something made in Australia, whether it's a you know, giant film or a, a tiny film. Uh, there's a core of uh, uh, of cast and crew that will be you know, equal to the challenge. And uh, so more American shows are sending their streaming series to uh, to Australia, uh, where they can get bang for the buck uh, and great landscapes, let's say. Or oh, great uh, great landscapes, which you yeah. captured. Yeah, I, I mean to to bring up a, a, a not quite Hollywood, which we've all seen that documentary, and like you were a part of something super like awesome in the seventies, you know. And and speaking of landscapes, you know, uh, that's where we learned about um, uh, uh, the man from Hong Kong and stuff. So, and that was your first, that was like your first feature film, and it was like so unbelievably ambitious. Like I, I don't know, like, can we talk about that for a minute? Certainly, yes. Um, well, it, it, it was yeah an ambitious project. Certainly, you know, certainly for one's first film. Uh, you know, I'd just done dramatized documentaries before that, uh, and uh, you know, on sixteen millimeter, and suddenly I was having to, you know, uh, do what I'd always wanted to do, which was compose for the cinemascope frame, because uh, you know I just. I love a wide screen. Yes. And then, yeah. And it can, if it can reach to the edge of your peripheral vision, uh, you know, I, I did actually see one three panel Cinerama uh, uh, movie, uh, How the West Was Won, before it became single you know, camera, single projector, 70 millimeter. Uh, so I've actually seen uh, uh, How the West Was Won where you're in, in, in the sweet spot uh, where the three projector beams you know, cross uh, and this, you know, the curved screen completely uh, uh, covers your, your peripheral vision. And that, that was, that's quite something. I guess you can wear a helmet and do it in virtual reality now. But uh, yeah. uh, to, to, to do it and have it in sort of six-track stereo or something, and, uh, uh, and you're right in the middle of the middle stalls, perfect place to see it. So anyway, I digress. But uh, cinema, going to the movies used to be have an, a sense of occasion to it, even if it was a suburban theater running a double bill. Uh, and, and then, you know, trailers, newsreel, uh, a cartoon, a, 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 a supporting feature was often a, an American film that had maybe had 10 minutes cut out of it. To, uh, and then a, a main feature. And that was three and a half hours of uh, of entertainment, um, and uh, there, there was yeah, and the, the theatre manager of a small town, that, or a small village that I grew up in, three thousand people, an air force base that my father commanded very nearby. Um, the theatre manager sort of knew the local patrons and uh, greeted them by name, and uh, uh, there, there was it, it was a different ambiance when I was growing up. Now I don't expect things that to stay the same as, sure. as, as my childhood. Uh, and I'm quite happy to go to them all. Uh, and, uh, yeah, as I have for, you know, you know decades uh, and see a movie uh, and, and there. And I'm happy to see one on a 60 inch screen too. Me too. Like to me, to me, like it's something that I always bring up. I never fell out of love with the movies. Like no. I, e even like during COVID it sucked because it's like, I missed I missed going to the theater. And once I was able to do that, it was like, I just went, like, I just saw the new terrifier movie. I just saw barbarian. Like anytime I get a chance to go, we just go and it. Even if it's yeah. pricey, it's still like absolutely worth it. You know, like big tub of popcorn and uh, the ritual of going to the movies is something that I, that I still very much love. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. Though so I have to say, yesterday I went to the 4.20 p.m. opening Friday uh, performance of Amsterdam. Okay. My friend and I were the only people in the theater. Wow. What a cast, too. Like what a Now, I think there's something about that film that was not appealing to people in a rural Oregon area. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, how, how was it, though? Well, I kind of enjoyed it. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, David O. Russell meets Wes Anderson. Oh, uh, I love it, that. It, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a whimsical uh, telling of, uh, uh, of, you know, a, a, a little slice of American history, let's say, uh, uh, you know, as they say at the beginning of, of, of the film and the title, uh, most of what, uh, of what you see is true. So uh, anyway, so and, and I, I love history, uh, even if it's somewhat revisionist, um, being put on the screen. Uh, history is good for people. Yeah, you know, we need to learn more histories from the lessons learned from the past um, can be useful. Otherwise, we'll repeat those mistakes in the future. I feel which, like I feel like we repeat them all the time. <laughs> we, do. We, 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 we can't help ourselves. We are a flawed species. Um, and, uh, anyway, uh, if, if I could ask you about, sorry to interrupt, but, um, the, the man from Hong Kong, the son at the end with, with, when on fire and struggling to get his jacket off, you're performing a stunt. Cause that stunt is absolutely amazing. It's amazing on screen. At what, what point do you realize something's wrong and <laughs> like you keep rolling, like it's, you get it. He must like. Could you could you talk about that scene, please? Yeah. Uh, yes, I yeah, I've spoken about this a number of times, uh, and uh, yeah, the report in the in the hot, in not quite Hollywood is not strictly accurate. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but you know, uh, it, it, it's uh, I, I you know I I have to say that I I should not have set myself on fire in front of George Lazenby to persuade him that nothing would go wrong. Uh, and it was a, a macho challenge, in effect, though I didn't put it to him in those in that, those terms. But how could he refuse uh, after? See, okay, that works. We'll take very good care of you, and we did take very good care of him as as much as we could. But but, but he did get a, a, a burn on the inside of his wrist there, about you know two to three inches long, um, when he couldn't get the jacket off. The miscalculation that we had made was that. Uh, the uh, that the costuming the, the the one layer of costume to have the water gel you know, soaked in another layer of costuming to keep it the water as a barrier to keep the water gel from getting to the third layer of costuming, which is what the jacket uh, would be set on fire. Um, uh, the, the extra layers made it difficult for him to get the jacket off. Uh, and it worked fine in the rehearsal uh, without fire, but comes the time when he was struggling to get the, uh, the or trying to get the jacket off and then throw the burning jacket in, uh, in Jimmy Wong Yu's face. And then the fight would continue after that, you know, that brief section where he is blocking and punching while on fire, which was the money shot. Yes. James Bond on fire, the yeah. actual guy. Uh, and uh, so um, it, it, it's, it, yeah, I'm sure it was, it was a, a gimmick that uh, I, I thought would be effective. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, I always had it in mind because we kind of pioneered fire stunts without a fire suit in Australia because of this Australian invention of water gel. Um, but uh, uh, so in the course of trying to get the jacket off, uh, he it, it rubbed off some of the gel right there. And that's where um, he it, that's where the flame book got him. Uh, and uh, but. As and naturally, when that starts happening, you and nothing is is actually following the the order of uh, of, of, of movements in the rehearsal. He, he clear, I, we clearly see he was uh, in distress, and we had told him, "If you feel anything is wrong, hit the deck." 
and we'll put the fire blanket over you. So he was still struggling with the jacket, and uh, Grant and I, you know, we looked at one another. He, Grant, immediately tackled him at the knees, brought him to the ground. We threw the blanket over him. Uh, and uh, in, you know, the two days of, of medical relaxation, help, et cetera, um, he was back on the set, uh, and uh, we yeah, put a special sleeve. We, 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 yeah, we were able to protect the burned area. He had second degree burns from uh, in, a, in, a, in, in that little, yeah, about that size. Uh, and uh, but he it didn't scar. And uh, um, George was upset <laughs> because I had said nothing will go wrong. Yes. Yeah. Never say to anybody, nothing will go wrong. Uh, <laughs> yes. <right. laughs> that was the only that was the only mistake. But I mean, at, listen, at the end of the day, like we one of the things that we always talk about is is the beauty of 70s and 80s action, um, it, because it seemed so real, because for the most part, it was there was no like, you know, th that was the beauty of stunt doubles. You know, we had on Sam Furstenberg on, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with. I know, I know, um, sure. Yes. <laughs> so we talked about like his movies and how growing up you know we're kids of the 80s and 90s like we we appreciate like the actual like i mean like george lazenby was on fucking fire i mean like you can't get crazier than that you know so that's the beauty like now you watch an action movie and it looks like the rock is playing a video game behind him you know so it doesn't really have that appeal to us so we appreciate the stuff that you were doing yeah. It must have took a certain breed of guys to want to get into stunts in that era this year risk yeah. it much all the time well i mean look uh you, you certainly don't want to work with anybody who has a death wish uh so you you i mean i work with people who had a pretty you know good respect for the danger of what they were doing uh and yeah we you know basically no one was seriously hurt uh we did have one stunt in man from hong kong which uh, a stuntman broke his ankles by being hit by a, an out of control motorbike. Wow, um, that was bad. I wish that had ha not happened, but you know, I, 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 I there's a story attached to that one too, but I won't go into it. But it, 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 the thing about doing action safely is to be able to predict every single outcome in that particular instance. We didn't predict that the stuntman was deaf. Uh, and had not got his hearing aids on, and that the bike uh, had, had lost control. Uh, and the combination of those two things, uh, and uh, which affected the stuntman's reaction time, um, uh, caused that particular accident. But, you know, it, it, I think we tried at all times, and I've always done this to, uh, you know, predict what could go wrong. And uh, so, you know, considering the number of stunts that were done in those movies um, yeah. by lots of other directors, including you know, George Miller, uh, you know, the, the casualty rate was extremely low. That's uh, the, the, the percentage of, uh, so Grant Page, like uh, w one of my favorite quotes of uh, Stunt Rock was uh, that guy was like, we use him because he doesn't know when to stop, you know. So it's it's funny to hear that. Like, well, actually, yeah. You see, Grant does know when to stop. <laughs> no, but uh, it, he, he wouldn't be with us. Uh, he he always had had a safety net, you know. Somehow, well, it, well, frequently did things without a safety net. But he had another kind of a safety net insofar as he had a body harness and a cable to a carabiner on his wrist, which the camera couldn't see, which attached him to a rope so that even if he fainted, uh, he would not fall off. Well, he, he, he was not a, a, a pure madman. Um, I, I just, some of the, some of the stories in the book and then some, uh, you know, in, in, the, the, um, the documentary as well crazy uh stunt rock i mean it's just amazing for anyone that's never seen it definitely something worth checking out because it's it's like nothing we've ever seen before right we were trying to explain stunt rock and we're like i don't even know how to explain really what it is but like it's just fun yeah what is well I, my wife described it quite well in the movie she said there's stunts there's rock we'll call it stunt rock 
uh, and uh, anyway, so I had to, I had to justify yeah. the title somehow. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then and then the, the the closing track, it made sense too. But uh, yeah. what what was like, you know, the one time, like the one thing, and I'm sure there's many things, but it was the one thing that really stands out that you saw Grant do that you're like, I can't believe he just did that. Uh, uh, hmm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, when you do a stunt uh, with a, a, a practiced stunt man like Grant, uh, you accept that he has done all the calculus. He's worked out the physics of it uh, and, you know, weight, you know, ratio, speed, uh, angle, uh, all those factors have been taken into account. Uh, and uh, then when there is a glorious result, um, uh, it's really as a result of all the calculations being correct. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, I, I, there were, you know, a number of great shots of all time that I think Grant has pulled off. Um, the, the first, you know, I mean, obviously I, I, I'd worked with him on uh, my first documentary, uh, The Stuntman, and uh, the, uh, and the, and then subsequently in Danger Freaks. So the catapult stunt, which you see at the beginning of Stunt Rock, uh, is, is a gasp worthy moment, but it's all, you know, totally under control, predictable, and happened exactly as, as, uh, as was planned. Uh, in Man from Hong Kong, I was looking for another gasp moment of the kite uh, flying over the heads of um, marching uh, Hong Kong police, who incidentally had fixed bayonets <laughs> as Grant passed over them. <laughs> fixed bayonets at the slope uh, as Grant uh, passed over them in his uh, his his hang glider. So, uh, and that yeah, with a, 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 a high angle looking down on the wide shot of the uh, uh, of, of the of, of the parade ground, that yeah, I, I knew that if, if he flew at just the right angle. That would be a, ga a gasp-worthy moment. I think I'm introducing an interesting visual effect into your broadcast here. Now. Like it. It's kind of, um, <laughs> well, it, 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 it's one of those moments in a, either a Marvel movie or um, you know, where the, 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 someone transitions into something else. And, ah, you're, and, just, you're just uh, letting us know that you're, you're letting us know that you're the real star of the podcast. I get it. Well, yes, but I think what I will do now is adjust the lighting. Uh, also, Brian, Brian just, just more just, real, for less the, fun, isn't it? For the record, we, we only use the audio. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, that will make no sense to anybody. But that was an interesting image, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. I mean, we could, yeah. do, we could do the visuals. We can get a screen grab. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, I mean, you should take... You can, Screen grabs of that, and then you pepper the interview with, uh, with any moments. You you should certainly try and get a screen grab of the epe. I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do anything that you suggest that we do. Because well, anyway, I'll leave it to you. You have the material, and you can manipulate it as you wish. Um, I heard you say that um, that stunt rock it was your least favorite of the films you did, or Kim, is that accurate, or? No, well, I don't know. It depends when I was talking at the time, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Stunt Rock was not appreciated. It was, it was not an, a, a commercial success, uh, even though it did achieve sales. Uh, it, it, when it went on sale, it, 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 see, it, it achieved sales in excess of its budget. Mm -hmm. But then it was totally mishandled by uh, the distributors. Uh, and... You know, just uh, the British distributor took it on, got it through censorship, and then immediately went bankrupt before the uh, release. Uh, and, you know, that, so th this happened uh, and in America. The distributor went bankrupt as well. Uh, or w one took it into his library, declared bankruptcy immediately. He'd only acquired it so to fatten his library for an eventual bankruptcy settlement. Uh, we managed to get it back. But then the next distributor took it on. We never got proper reporting, and then they went bankrupt. Um, anyway, I, I control. Wow. I control the negative now, and uh, uh, so 
Uh, and now it is available uh, on Blu-ray uh, in America and, uh, uh, and, and through the release by Umbrella Entertainment, uh, Region of Free. Um, and uh, it's an ideal movie for a party. Uh, some is. people want to watch it. And in, in, in Toto, other people will be happy to be you know, eating, dancing, you know, chatting, drinking, and then say, oh, look at that. Wow, look at him do that. That's yeah. not amazing. Uh, anyway, and some people just will enjoy the, the music. And it's, uh, uh, well, it, it's a portrait of, you know, uh, um, heavy metal rock and roll um, <laughs> yeah. violence, uh, of 1978. Yes, uh, I, I'm just yeah. remembering what Grant said about the music, so I'm laughing to myself. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> but but you know, sorcery they 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 were passionate about their music. They sure were. <laughs> uh, I mean, they were as an interesting fusion of a bunch of, of magicians yeah. um, and a bunch of um, rockers. Um, and they were ideally a Vegas act, um, but their attempts to 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 you know get into the, the the swim, so to speak, were you know harmed by you know, the L.A. fire marshal attending their performance of the whiskey and then declaring them in, in an illegal act because they were a, a, a fire hazard. Uh, so that was going to until they had done a massive upgrade. Uh, to conform to you know all the necessary health and safety regulations in public menus, um, that was going to crimp their ability to perform. But uh, performing for us in a fake concert setting in Culver City Studios uh, was a, a, another matter. That that was good. Um, but no, and it, yeah, we were working with people firing propane, propane from their fingertips. Um, but we took care of all the safety precautions and that no one was, was singed. So that, that is good. Um, so, um, but they're an interesting band. Uh, and, you know, you, you listen to their stuff today and it, it, it really, yeah, it is of its uh, of a particular type, but it's uh, it, 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 it holds up well if, uh, if you like that sort of thing. For sure. Uh, Lang, you had a turkey shoot thing, right? Oh, yeah, I was, if we could talk about turkey shoot before I want to get into your horror stuff. Um, hunting I humans. The, hunting humans is pretty horrific. I, and it's, you know, hunting humans. Come on, that's hard, too. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. But I, um, the the female leads on the, the Lydia Stoner and Olivia Hussey, did, were there some difficulties there in the um, in, 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 uh, the nude scene, I believe, and, and, and maybe she was a, a Lydia was an animal rights. Uh... Well, yes, uh, the, 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 yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't think. Uh, let's deal with Olivia first, a sweet lady. Uh, it's still in in Facebook touch with her. Um, uh, I, I mean, <clears throat> she didn't really belong in a movie like Turkey Shoot. Right. Uh, I mean, I. I Remember that films of that kind, the lead cast was always chosen by the distributor. Mm -hmm. and the concept was uh, the American film markets coming up, uh, uh, the the uh, the Oscar nominations are being uh, announced. Uh, Steve Railsback is going to get an, uh, probably a nomination for his role in the Stunt Man. Uh, that some the stunt man is certainly going to get some nominations, and Richard Rush did too. Um, so let's get a cast of Academy Award nominees that we can quickly announce at this the the, uh, the American film market and get pre-sales based on them. So what's the other nominee we can get? That well, Diana Scarwood is going to get nominated for uh, Mommy Dearest. Okay, so that that was the initial pair. Well. Steve stuck with it, um, and Diana Scarwood said, don't be silly. Uh, and uh, so who, who do you get next? Uh, so um, Olivia Hussey has a pretty impressive uh, you know, series of credits prior to 1982. 
uh, or 81 when we, uh, and uh, so uh, she accepted. Um, she was prepared to do nudity uh, provided it was doubled. Uh, and uh, uh, she said, that I don't think my body is, is very attractive. Uh, and uh, um, join, anyway, join uh, the join the club. <laughs> well, uh, uh, she's yeah, beautiful. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we we yes. always we talk we always talk about her in Black Christmas for sure. So I crushed on her since I was a little kid. Well, <laughs> who, who would not? Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, a, 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 a yeah, a, a sweet lady, uh, and uh, so. <sighs> Everything, nonetheless, looked fine for as far as they, the, the two lead cast were concerned when they came to Australia expecting what was basically going to be 36 days of shooting. Um, but uh, then, uh, and it was actually, it was at one point going to be 40 days of shooting. But uh, when they arrived, they found that the budget had been cut effectively by a third um, but that had been taken out of the, uh, the, the above the line fees remain the same. Uh, no one's going to take a cut. Um, I didn't get paid until virtually the movie was delivered um, because of cash flow shortages. Uh, but uh, so, you know, not, you know, a, 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 you know, a goodly chunk of the budget did not turn up. Uh, Due to various things that I think I explained on the DVD and I've explained in my book. Yeah, you explained in the book like I, <laughs> a lot of times, like the business of it. You know, everything from like pitching stuff to the to the leprechaun people to like the the drive hard stuff. Like it seems like a a, a very tough business to get attached to something that just doesn't get made sometimes. Yes, yes, as a yeah, uh, there, there are many great projects. Uh, that I would like to have made that uh, just didn't quite make it to the finish line. But anyway, but uh, so in the uh, attempted rape scene, uh, in which uh, you know, the the rapist gets uh, his John Thomas caught in his zipper, um, <laughs> uh, that you know, so that's something I've always wanted to put on the screen. I hasten to add, uh, uh, but uh, eventually Ben Stiller kind of did it. Yes. To, uh, for, for laughs, Frank and uh, Beans. Yes, uh, and uh, some, uh, some, something about Mary. Uh, uh, but you know, back, you know, in in eighty one, it was something I wanted to do. I like, I, I, I kind of like to, I, I wanted to put taboos on the screen uh, because, well, I guess, you know, we they had been uh, set. We we wanted to. Sort of stamp on censorship restrictions of the past uh, with with gusto uh, because yeah that's the way we felt um, and it uh, seemed like the eighties was like a good place to do that because I feel like a lot of people were probably doing that you know like wh whether yeah, it was no, like no, the no. Ho the horror genre or like the action genre you know for sure hmm. yeah now uh, as for Linda Stoner well again she. She soon realized this was not going to be a big A-list feature. This is obviously an exploitation film, which I think would have been fairly evident from the script. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes the actors only read their part. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, so, you know, she, she was not happy and she'd just gone through a relationship breakup. Uh, and... Uh, um, and she was, you know, was kind of a bit of a sex symbol. And so she was subject to a lot of sexism uh, in, in, in her career. Um, and uh, this just seemed like another sort of male dominated movie that was. Uh, um, so the budget shortfalls and the fact that, yeah, you know, I asked her to to work on raw fish in one scene. And she, um, she you know, she was a strict vegetarian and that included you know not having to deal with the uh, with fish um, and uh, so and so she hated the movie and then naturally critics hated the movie initially um now critics are embracing its politics and uh yeah. and embracing its its you know rambunctiousness it's uh, um it, it, it's you know ahead it, of its time yeah and, and and then the fact that it sort of uh 
you know, breaks taboos with lip smacking relish. Uh, and so, uh, but and like it was streaming sites like now, like that's the beauty of, you know, things like Tubi or like Amazon Prime, where like a lot of this work gets thrown up on there and people read mm -hmm. it and they could watch it now too. Cause it, there was a lot of the stuff in your filmography that, that I didn't really know when I watched it. I was like, Oh my God, this is like really cool. So I, I, you know, I love it. I love the technology oh. now. Oh yeah. It, that, that is good though. I would say as a member of the directors guild of America, I'm entitled to some residuals. Sure. Uh, on repeat screenings of films along with other members of the BGA and, or, and also similarly the, the WGA, the Writers Guild. Uh, and uh, I don't see any of those trickling down somehow from Tubi or, or YouTube or where a number of films of mine are now sitting, and I'm very glad that people are able to, to access them if they, if they want. Uh, so there are, you know, I've made 42 long forms and a few interesting shorts like Hospitals Don't Burn Down. Now, there's a film for you. I watched that. Did you? Yeah. Nice. My, yeah. My, library, uh, my library has a streaming service, and I, I had searched his name direct on that. And uh, yeah. Wow. Incredible fun fire to stunts. Make, fun to make a, an industrial safety film as a horror movie. Uh, and uh, so, and it was very effective. It became the highest selling industrial <laughs> film that Australia ever made. It was sold all over the world, won awards uh, in medical and industrial film festivals, uh, even got a, a short film prize from the Cork Film Festival. So it was, uh, you know, uh, quite. Uh, Quite an interesting uh, exercise shot over 18 nights. Uh, and uh, we, we called it the Towering Infirmary. Uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so. Uh, great, great, uh, great memories. I, and and I, that's that's the beauty of the book, too, as well. Uh, we're we're VHS kids, too. You know, like a, a lot of the wow. a lot of the direct to video stuff. Um, I me and Brian Langan. <laughs> All, both loved Night of the Demons, man. Kevin Tenney oh, did such a yeah. great job. It's it's, yes. it's 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 like something that we want. Well, I watch like uh, uh you know every Halloween because it's perfect. And then the sequel comes out, and me personally, I think the sequel is actually better than the original. It's yeah. I don't know what it is. I can see that. It, it's just like uh, all right here. The dialogue usually in these movies, the dialogue is 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 kind of hokey, but the 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 teens, the casting, the dialogue was kind of funny. Like it was almost like a like a Porky's meets like horror type thing in, in, in that stuff. And uh, so, if you could just like kind of just give us a little bit on Night of the Demons too, like how that came about. Well, yes, uh, it, for whatever reason, Republic Pictures that wanted to do the sequel. Uh, some six years after the original had come out and been successful, uh, uh, they, you know, they did not want Kevin to do the sequel. He, he had done a sequel to his Witchboard movie, uh, and he thought he would he'd like to do the sequel. But they said, "No, we want to try someone else," uh, and uh, which is a pity because Kevin set the template, and while. I appreciate your uh, kind thoughts about uh, Demons 2 being better than Demons 1. It, it had all the advantage of being uh, thought through six years later <clears throat> and had a bit more money. I think they made Demons 1 for about $800,000. And wow. we had a million three. Well, I suppose at the end of the day, when Republic said, we like it so much, we're going to throw another hundred and fifty thousand dollars at you for a, a climax on top of the climax you just shot. Steve Johnson. Um, Steve Johnson Steve is a Steve genius. Johnson, yes, um, amazing, amazing creative genius. Anyway, so uh, that. Yeah, but as for how it came about, um, uh, I the producers invited me to audition to the distributor, uh, other em eminent. Uh, but obviously at that point, not 
no, not DGA, not Directors Guild members. Uh, they could, they were not going to go DGA, but non-DGA directors uh, such as Tony Randall and Jeff Burr. Wow, or, Tony uh, Randall. Yeah, uh, auditioned or, um, but I was the one that I, I knew I, if I had to break through the competition. I was, I did a lot of homework before the, so I came in with how to do this sequence, how this would look good. Uh, I, one of the things I suggested was a, a, a dripping tap, but it dripped upside down. And with a split screen, you could uh, you could do that. Uh, uh, and uh, so I came up with with uh, and that, that idea never m made it into the movie, but it was then borrowed and put into I think uh, Demons Three. <laughs> so anyway, doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, ne ne never I, saw that. But, <laughs> but I mean, I tell the story because it's an example of you know if you really want something, you got to put in the work. Yes, uh, and I think that's what caused them not to use a tried and true uh, horror director with uh, established credits, uh, but some, and yeah, my horror uh, credentials were at that point not not as well established as they are now. Turkey Shoot was, was not, <clears throat> not as, it only became uh, better thought of uh, yeah, I think once Quentin discovered it. Uh, You're right. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, but anyway, the hard work was was worth it, and I got the gig. And uh, uh, and but I said, okay, if you, now you've chosen me, I think you need to make the whole thing a, a lot more uh, amusing. Uh, it should have a bit of uh, you know homage quality to it but you know had more have as many cultural references uh, as possible I and mean, the original had had them too but uh, let's see what uh, cultural uh, you know buttons we can press um, and uh, uh, the my producers were you know were, were both raised Catholics I was not uh, but uh, I was raised Protestant which uh, Protestants were taught to hate Catholics you know but I didn't because I'm not uh, but you know that that <laughs> you look at the propaganda of both sides. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, so I always thought that uh, religious conflict was uh, ridiculous, um, and, uh, um, and, and if there is a supreme being, he certainly doesn't want his children squabbling over precisely how to worship him. But, Absolutely, uh, right. that's the subject of another podcast. Perhaps. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, so I said, let's let's have fun with it. You know, I. Let's have a demon stabbing the priest to death while reciting the act of contrition. Yes. You know, that that you know that that will shock them um, a little. Uh, so uh, so there there were things like that that I that wanted to put into it, and, and my tone was obviously you did you. There was a lot of stuff on there, and it's funny because I think like later on. A movie from I think New Zealand, Deathgasm, did a lot of like the similar stuff. It reminded me of too, but like, like for for people like us that are not really religious, like it's just like, you know, it's it's whatever to us. It's more entertaining. So I think if you are, you kind of watch it and you're like, oh my god, like you know. But the nun was absolutely amazing. Like in the very beginning, you kind of like hate her because she's such a she's mm. such a bastard to them. But then mm -hmm. she's like the saving grace, and uh, it's just a really good cast. Ben Stiller's wife is in it; like, it's just yeah. fantastic. Gee, how did he let her go? I wonder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Christine, she was yeah a, a lovely girl. Well, you know, speaking speaking of the zipper scene, I had to throw it back to Ben. You know. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but I mean the uh, yeah uh, it, it, it it was <clears throat> it was she, Christine Taylor had good comedy instincts uh, and uh, uh, so did many members of the cast uh, uh, and Rick Peters who plays sort of the bad boy um, he yeah I encouraged improvisation and uh, in the scene where he meets you know the girls coming who are going to come with him on the to to to, to Hull House um as she gets into the car he uh, uh he, he turns to her and says what's your problem Marsha uh, yes because, that's yeah. right yeah and he, 
he made a reference to the fact that she kind of looks like Marsha Brady. Well, three yeah. months later, she auditions for the part of Marsha Brady and she gets it. Uh, so, you know, so, so funny how things turn up. It is funny because just recent. So I did a rewatch of it because I'm like, all right, I haven't watched it. I knew we were going to have this conversation. My girlfriend never saw it, but she loved that Brady Bunch movie. So as soon as she saw her on screen, she's like, that's Marsha Brady. And then that scene happened. I was like, holy shit, I totally forgot about that scene. It, it's just great. And it, listen, when it when it comes to making horror comedies, you know, um, it's very hard to do. Some of them are pretty fucking terrible, but this one is really good. Like certain, like, you know, Return of the Living Dead is great. Um, Night of the when Creeps it, is when it works, it's amazing. It's it's laughing and being scared. It's almost like cousins in, in a way, yes. you know. Yeah. And, and and I think there was uh, there were enough scares in Night of the Demons. Oh, too. without a doubt, yeah. Mm -hmm. And enough ooh um, moments. Uh, uh, and but look, uh, Leprechaun Three, yes, probably could have used uh, a bit more horror uh, because I had by that time uh, ramped up the comedy more. And then when I went to Leprechaun in Space. I moved from comedy to, you know, basically cinema parody um, and, a, and a basically a pastiche of of gags, uh, which some people just, it, it, it was a bridge too far, let's say, or as that movie was sometimes known, an hour too long. Um, but... Um, <laughs> hey uh, <-o. laughs> But, uh, hey, I could have got my scissors into that one and it would have been a cracking two hours. Um, and that, uh, it, but, uh, hey, so what really works, so like that franchise in particular, we always talk about how we don't really like the franchise except for three, and we like the one that that dude Steve Kostans uh, Kostansky made which was the very last one, which is Leprechaun Returns, and because they were so, like, I don't know, there was something, like, great about them. I think 3 is better than the original, to be honest with you. And I read two, that Warwick Davis 3 is his favorite one that he did. I had yes. written an interview. Yeah, yeah and he, he, we, he and I had a great relationship because he felt he'd been kind of sidelined on number two. You know, he waited for hours in this makeup and... Uh, he was kept in the shadows of the movie as a lurking threat. Uh, and he wanted to do more stuff. And I said, Warwick, you will do plenty of stuff. Let's 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 plug into your comedic side um, and we'll find all these little funny roles you can play. Uh, in, 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 uh, you know, you can be a you can be a, 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 a doctor in an hospital. You can do all these funny television commercials. Yes. For, uh, there are all sorts of characters you can play. So he loved that. And uh, then I thought, well, let's do some more of that, of course, uh, in Leprechaun in Space. I think it, it, I, I was ready to go uh, to jump the shark, let's say, with Leprechaun in Space. I think some of the traditional Leprechaun audience were not quite ready to jump the shark. In fact, they fell into the water. Yeah. <laughs> I made it to the uh, the other side. So it, some people you know, were disappointed. Uh, and certainly if I had done some more, you know, a couple of really nasty horror moments, the movie might have prospered better. It still shipped 40,000 VHS copies in its initial run. I mean, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's uh, uh, done well for the inheritors of the copyright. Abs uh, abs absolutely. And, and, and to go back to three, so the name of our show is Red River Podcast, right? Yes. So we took that name from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 when Caroline Williams was working for a radio station. And that was the name of the radio station. Oh, I see. So yes, like, good yeah, you. like totally. Caroline Williams was great in three. Caroline Lovely lady, lovely lady. Uh, so such great comic timing. I mean, that's a you know that that's a masterpiece uh, of of comedic playing the way she sculpted that role uh, from you know you know blousy cynical uh, you know, uh, has been uh, yeah uh, and uh, yeah and then uh, yeah to like bombshell yeah. The bombshell, and then, uh, you know, uh, her inevitable demise, Beauty. which is 
I mean, appallingly sexist in every way. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yes. Uh, but you know, the thing about putting sexism on the screen is that it is a sort of a two-way street. Uh, I mean, in a way, you know, retrograde people will laugh at it and not think that's bad behavior. But a lot of people will, will recognize that the bad behavior that is being spotlighted, yeah, it, the spotlight is, is is intended to say, yeah, you know, people who think this way are not cool. Very uh, much so. Like it, it, sometimes when I see someone acting like an asshole, it just reminds me to not act like an asshole. <laughs> You know, like you're just like, all right, so, there's a be there's a beauty to that. But uh, one of the parts in the books that I really like uh, is you going to Trimark talking about Leprechaun 4. And just like it reminded me or not reminded me, but it made me think of like, you know, situations like that where you try to pitch this movie and you're trying to win over this like boardroom of people to like move forward with this idea and like i i, I mean can you just talk a little bit about that 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 part in the book and how often something like that happens well i mean uh i've never had to make quite such a detailed pitch uh, <laughs> it was pretty detailed well i, I thought you know, when you say, well, what's when they ask, what's the best scene in the movie? Yes. Uh, and I say, well, you know, I talk about, uh, you know, we, we, well, if, if, if we're going to do a, you know, initially they, they, the, the concept had been a kind of a spoof of Apollo 13. And I said, well, it's a very small space capsule and you could really run out of opportunities. You know, why don't you go for, you know, uh, the aliens matrix as a, as, as a coat hanger, let's say, to hang the whole thing on and uh, have a platoon of space marines uh, uh, hunting down a creature. And the creature is, is a leprechaun with a lightsaber in his shillelagh and, and on from there. Uh, and uh, so I was asked, you know, what is the best scene? And I said, well, obviously, you know, we're going to have, you know, we've got to have a, an equivalent of the chest burster scene in, in Aliens. And, uh, uh, and the, the head of the company said, well, that scene's been done many times. I said, not like this. And then I said, well, what about when they blow the leprechaun to pieces and one of the Marines decides in a sort of victory ritual to piss on one of the body parts? Um, you, uh, we, we see in an angle taken from behind his spread legs and the urine stream pointing downwards, uh, a little green ca capsule traveling back up the urine stream. Of course, I looked at the faces around the table and they were a little aghast, let's say, you know, it's one thing to talk about body parts, but urine streams. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I said, well, this means that when they get back to the spaceship and this Marine and a lady Marine go down to the cargo hold to, you know, make the beast with two backs or um, however they want to do it, really. Hey. Uh, then she has a, her hand in his pants and he's saying, not so rough. You want to, <laughs> you want to take it home with you? Uh, and he doubles up in pain and then sinks to the ground. Uh, and this will enable us. I said with great enthusiasm to have a false floor below him. And then we can have the Warwick Davis apparently clawing it his way out of the, uh, the, some, you know, carefully made uh, prosthetic pants uh, and erupting out of his body uh, on a wire um, and landing in front of him and saying, next time, my lad, you should wear a prophylactic. Um, so, uh, they all, you know, clearly there were people around the table who thought, well, I'm glad I didn't bring him in. Uh, you know, he, you, he's over to you, pal. Uh, uh, you brought him in. Um, and uh, the boss was quite, his face was impassive throughout. And then, so it was a moment of silence. He says, so a leprechaun comes out of the man's penis. And I said, yes. Possibly with too much enthusiasm, but and that's just me. Uh, and it, then he said, "It worked." Like it. And then suddenly, all around the table, everybody liked it. Yeah, uh, there you go.
That's one hell of a pitch right there. <laughs> I mean, and it worked, you know, it, it, it's, it, you know, for us that don't, we don't make movies and, and we're not a part of these things. It's like so interesting to like, think of like just going into this room to pitch the Trimark. Trimark put out some of our favorite, like direct to video movies, like return of the living dead three. I'll stand by that masterpiece. Yes. No, it's great. It's great. I loved it. Right. Like, right. Brains. Yes. Brian Usna, like we had Brian on. He's yes, killer. I've, I've met him. He's a great guy. So, you know, it's funny, like as we talk, like you've seen so much shit. Like you're like, you've seen everything, <laughs> like everything that I mentioned, you've seen. So you're, you're definitely oh, all about yeah. the, all about the movies. Well, I, I still am. Uh, I mean, as far as Hollywood is concerned, I am unfortunately considered past my use by date. Uh, but uh, uh, but that's okay. But you know, fresh blood has to be you know introduced and uh, and does well. There are many great horror directors coming up, um, and you've mentioned a few titles earlier. Uh, and uh, so uh, Any, anything I, that anything that you've seen recently that that maybe like you, you want to mention? Well, I or TV I shows. Thought, well, I thought Barbarian had a had a lot of sustained tension in yes it. uh and while i ultimately didn't find the denouement as satisfying as i was hoped as i hoped it would be uh the fact is it 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 did let's say tightened my sphincter uh for you know <laughs> Uh, good sort of two thirds of its running time. So and I'll tell there's, you, there's an image for you. You're um, you're 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 a big fan of camera angles, right? So yes, when it goes to the the section where they're following, you know the 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 fifty nineteen fifties or whatever. You, no, it was the eighties. It was the eighties because they mentioned they mentioned Reagan. Reagan. The, ca yes. the camera shot, like where it was like this, like like it was like jarring. Right. Like, I, I don't know if you remember, like it like, was following the guy into like the supermarket. And yeah. like I, I don't know what the hell kind of camera angle that was, but like, wow, very, very cool. I mentioned it because I know you're a camera angles guy. Yeah. No, I, I think he needed to do something striking to suddenly thrust you into this uh, this time warp, so to speak, to go back to the, the backstory of, uh, of of the killer. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. You're not expecting that. No. So <clears throat> it was a daring piece of script construction uh, and it was was well executed. Now, I don't know how much the movie cost because I know there was shooting in Eastern Europe uh, and uh, the cast would not have cost very much. Yes. So uh, in, in some pretty heavyweight producers involved, all of whom I'm sure uh, had a nice fee, uh, but even so... Um, I, I know how cheaply I could have made that film on exactly the same scale, uh, uh, even shooting it entirely in the United States. But you know, if they did some Eastern European shooting, then they must have um, you know, really saved some money. Uh, anyway, that, that that was that film will be quite profitable. Um, and uh, and look, anyone who can keep basically a single location uh, suspense thriller going as effectively for two thirds of its running time uh, as Barbarian did uh, is uh, commendable. I'll be, it'd be interesting to see what they do next. I'm um, with you. There, there's like, I have one question left. I don't know what Langan has, but given any budget, what is one movie that you would make? Given any budget? Well, like if I had, yeah, you know, if I had, if I could say you know, I need, X dollars to make this. Yes. Well, obviously, I try and choose my own intellectual property. I would want to make a, a movie uh, out of Alice Through the Multiverse. Okay, uh, your book. My, my time tripping, you know, uh, you know piece that <clears throat> was initially a screenplay called The Executioner's Daughter, which was optioned twice but never made. Um, we couldn't get you know a female star big enough. Uh, a, a, a female star of let's say 20 uh, big enough and that, that they're hard to find uh, and uh, the ones that qualified yeah uh, well their representatives were simply not interested in entertaining it uh, but so I wrote it as a novel uh, and 
I think it could actually be uh, a, a streaming series. I've even broken, I've even formatted you know, in broad principle the first two seasons, uh, uh, ten episodes each uh, of Alice Through the Multiverse. Amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, and I, you know, that's been out, uh, you know, 20, 2018, I think. Yeah, 20 companies looked at it. Uh, only two expressed serious interest. Uh, one of them had a deal with Apple, a uh, first look deal with Apple. But when it came down to it, they said, yeah, we really don't know how to handle this. We don't know what to do with, with, with how to tell this story. Uh, to me, it was fairly simple. Film every page in the book, but anyway, there we go. Uh, right. But uh, and explore all the characters in greater depth because they all have interesting stories, and that's how the you know that's how you 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 keep people involved in a ten episode series. So you explore the supporting characters as well as the leads. Um, I, so I would certainly. It, Alice through the multiverse would make a great streaming series, or would I, make a great anime. You say I could do it as an anime, and then it could be even more spectacular, it, it and could. then then you could afford to do. Uh, but there, there are many stories. I yeah. I, um, it I could see. be Tarantino's tenth film. You never know when you see him uh, when he yes, when yes. he comes out there. <laughs> but um, never. I, I, uh, it, Adventures in the B Movie Trade is is the book, and uh, I I mean we could keep you here all day, but I like thank you so much for just hanging out with us. Yeah. Um, thank was, you. We, I, I'm, I'm flattered by your interest. Uh, yes, we we love talking to like people that make movies that we grew up with or watch or mm -hmm. discovered recently, like Stunt Rock, like which is like pretty crazy. Oh, right. Um. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'm gonna put this out on Monday, and I'll, I'll like send you a link and all that other stuff. And thank you so like seriously, thank you for, yes. for taking time for us and oh, have fun opinion. fencing. I, yes. I will. And by the way, I, you, you have Netflix, obviously. Yes. Uh, are you aware of Triple R? No. Oh, okay. R, R, R. It's a Bollywood movie in the Telugu language. Brilliant. You okay. have never seen anything like it. Uh -huh. you're Bollywood fans, but it's a gigantic action picture uh, set in the 1920s. Uh, that fictionalizes two rebels against the British Raj. It is wildly over the top with great heart and, and a lot of humor. Uh, and the two guys are incredibly charismatic. So if you've never seen a Bollywood action picture, you got to see Triple R. Okay, Triple R. I mean, listen, right. if, if you felt... If you feel like we should watch it, then we're going to watch it. And then while, while we're here, I'm going to say I think Vengeance. Uh, I, I told an 80-year-old man and his 80-year-old wife uh, yesterday to watch it. Uh, so it's just three hours long, you know. Uh, uh, you might want to watch it in chunks. Yeah, I mean, of course. Absolutely. He That's watched it all the, the way. He and his wife watched it all the way through last night and loved it. So join the 80-year-olds who love Triple uh, R and uh, take a look at it this weekend. Brian, I'm, I'm going to give you one. There's a movie called Vengeance that just came out. It's like one of our favorite movies of the year. It's oh. up on it's up on Peacock. It's absolutely brilliant. Amazing writing. Uh, I mean, could you write Langan? Like, we didn't know where it was going. Like, it was like, if we thought left, it went right. That's You're muted. The, that's the key to to really getting uh, an audience back into the cinema. You do, if you If the writing is clever, you, and the audience is not ahead of the writers. The writers, we, we were not, and and you think, as you say, uh, you think it's going left, and then it goes right, and then vice versa. So that's good. I will look out for vengeance. Yeah, it's uh, up on. It, it's on Peacock. Peacock. I don't have Peacock, but I. I you well. could you, you could rent it for like four bucks or something. Doesn't yes, matter. I will definitely take your recommendation. Brian, you're the man. Can't wait to talk more to you on Facebook. And uh, always happy to to talk to you. And uh, um, I'd love you to read Alice and see the movie in your mind. Okay. Mind. Uh, it said some people can get it for free on Kindle. Amazon cancelled my account. That's another story. <laughs> you know, you know, you know my website. Do you? Yeah, I have, we have we have all your links. Absolutely. 
Okay, so, well, I write about the how, how Amazon fucked me in the ass. Uh, oh, I, I didn't read that. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, it's, it's in, it's in a, a, one of my blogs on the website. Uh, but, but I then republished both Adventures in the B-Movie Trade and Alice Through the Multiverse through Ingram Spark. And you can get both those books through in, in regular bookshops and, and, of course, through Amazon. You say, fine, we'll keep selling it. And I'm busy probably writing more adventures. Uh, and maybe we'll publish another book. Uh, wow. in course, but we'll I, see. Yeah, I'm a, a, you know, we look forward to anything that you have coming up. So, Well, thank you. I must now go. And Take care. See you later, Bye. Brian's. Thank Bye. you very much. Okay, bye-bye.